Our next speaker uh, is um, Robert Sommel. He has been professor and director of the University of Illinois at Chicago, uh, of art, uh, Illinois, uh, at the University of Illinois uh, at Chicago's School of Architecture since 2007. Bob has taught architecture at many of the leading national schools, including Ohio State, the University of Michigan, Rice, Princeton, Harvard, and Columbia. A design critic and theorist, he is the editor of Autonomy and Ideology and serves on the editorial board of Any Log and, uh, the, forth and of the forthcoming uh, Flat Out. Bob's writings and, uh, have appeared in publications ranging, ranging from Assemblage to Wired and uh, will uh, appear in uh, his collection of essays, Nothing to Declare. He is the co-designer of Off Use, an award-winning studio and residence in uh, Los Angeles that extends his interest in combining the discipline of modernism with the excesses of mass culture. Bob is currently working on a book titled, This Will Cover That, Writing and Building from the Death of Corbusier to the End of Architecture. His talk today, a Chicago tradition of fantastic speculation, will look at the intersections of technology and ideology in Chicago architecture, with a particular focus on the post-1970 period. Please help me welcoming Bob to the podium. Thank you, Kim, and uh, thank you, Kim and Sam, for the invitation. It's, um, I accepted it because I don't usually get to uh, speak in such fabulous context, so uh, thank you for that. Um, and also because I was told that, I, that uh, we were asked to do a polemic, so I felt pretty comfortable with that. Uh, I figure you don't have to be comprehensive or even true when you give a polemic, so that's more or less where we're going. Um, it may, in fact, lead into territories more like a rant, a diatribe, and a harangue, but uh, it's really meant to put out some issues and topics really for the discussion at the end. This will not be as erudite and witty uh, as Bob or Stuart. Um, it's more, uh, hopefully, for the, for the future discussion. Um, I should, I just want to quickly pull out my phone so I don't go over. I may rush it through some things to try to keep it on time. Um, and I'm also getting a flu, so I apologize for the voice if it goes out. Um, uh, I want to thank uh, in advance, because I won't cite them later, both Bob Brugman, uh, former colleague at UIC, as well as current colleagues Penelope Dean, Alexander Eisenschmidt, and Jonathan McKinda, uh, all of whom have contributed to the thinking of this. So when I don't cite them, I'm not trying to steal their work. It's just that there's not enough time. Um, <laughs> Uh, and also our talented group of uh, designers. Um, the other confession I want to start with is that when the very, I think we have to talk about, obviously this conference is in the context of the biennial, and I think that for me that's what we're here to discuss in some way. And so I think we're right now dancing around the edges of it, and I would like to get to it at least uh, by the end of the discussion. In other words, what's the relationship of what happens in this room to what's happening out there in the cultural center or other parts of the city? Um, my confession is that when we first, uh, they first discussed it, I was at an early meeting and they asked for our suggestions after that. Um, I was not really involved anymore. Uh, but my only suggestion was, whatever you do, don't make it about Chicago. Um, and now here I am. So uh, at a Chicago conference. And uh, there are reasons for that and um, we can talk about those in the discussion. Um, and part of it is, the difficulty of talking about place as we approach the contemporary, or the significance of place as a defining mechanism to evaluate the significance of architecture. Um, uh, the other confession, I guess, is that I, um, uh, I'm not a practicing historian or a uh, historian practitioner, but I'm a mere administrator. So um, my, my remarks come from the point of view of being the director of a school of architecture and are motivated by those sets of interests. Um, uh, I think that's, that's it. So uh, my first question really uh, to put out on the table, and, and I think as Kim and Sam will tell you, we discussed this, uh, I feel like actually like Stuart in this, um, I was, we were sort of given a suggested title. Um, we worked it, went back a little bit, and I thought I was actually matching Stuart's title, which I realized wasn't his title anyway, so 
Uh, I was trying to be a good, play good ball, and I realized um, Stuart thought he was too. Um, but I, the question I really have is about traditions, um, because it seemed to me, and, and Bob's very um, generous and wide-ranging talk about the heterogeneity of, of work in Chicago keeps bringing this issue up to me, because I think you, know, you could equally just say periods. Why don't we just say periods? Uh, in other words, a convenient historical bracket to identify some set of work that in some way has no relationship to either, either typologically or in terms of its orientation or ideology. The other way would obviously be to talk about it in terms of schools, um, which you could say is more the, uh, the idea of movements or ideologies. So traditions uh, is suspect a little bit to me in a way because you could say, just, just talk about the facts, what got done, or let's talk about schools, which are equally contingent and biased, and we can therefore accept them. But somehow when we talk about traditions, I sort of feel that uh, it's really a, a way to naturalize or produce authority for something. In other words, there's a way that we should do things. And so traditions, to me, is a very contentious and loaded term, even before we get to the variations of tradition, meaning traditionalism, traditionalist, in other words, actual ideologies masking themselves as a natural, inevitable, and necessary form uh, for the future. So uh, that's my caveat about that. I, I learned to live with it, though, when I looked up tradition um, from the Latin. Um, like Stuart, I can't read my screen either. Uh, uh, not that I can say Latin even if I could read it. Uh, traditionium. Tridio, to hand over, deliver, surrender. Um, and I got uh, a little more comfortable with tradition when I realized that it has a um, doublet, a word with an identical etymology, which is treason. Uh, and so this is going to be a Chicago treason. Um, uh, and one really based uh, maybe in the spirit of where I come from, uh, which is UIC. Um, and so this is a, maybe a UIC treason. So in a way, my approach is both smaller and larger than the request, smaller in the sense that I'm not talking about Chicago in its entirety. I'm going to try to actually be a little specific in uh, loose affiliations that spill out of UIC, um, and bigger in the sense that my interest is really about the discipline of architecture. And to me, the discipline is bigger than a place. So the keepers of schools are the keepers of discipline. And I think that there's a loose fit and not a definitive one-to-one -one fit between place and discipline. Um, um, so, in a certain way, I guess what I'm saying is I don't think that places or cities are particularly good lenses through which to evaluate the significance of architecture, but I do think that architecture is an interesting uh, and potentially powerful lens through which to redefine uh, places and cities. So that, I suspect, will be a discussion uh, later on as well. The other, the, um, let's say the narrative I understand the, the conference to be about is a certain sense is that the five traditions, or as I would call them, periods, uh, that Bob identified and the conference identifies, um, more or less stop circa 1970. And so most of what we've seen also more or less stops then. Um, and, and the issue is what happens in the last 50 years? <laughs> um, you know, and I, I guess that the narrative I think of the conference is we're in a state of utter confusion. Um, and, you know, part of me wants to agree with that, um, that there is a certain sense of who are we and where do we go from here. Uh, and that's a problem, I think, with ever we approach the contemporary. Um, but I also think that if we, you know, uh, the question of to what extent going backward can cure this confusion is another issue. Um, um, and I think that that's, you know, what I would like to talk about as well. Um, you could say that the period of confusion begins with the death of Mies, 1969, just as an arbitrary beginning point. Um, you could also say it's with the completion of our building, uh, uh, Netsch's A&A &A building, uh, 1967. The first UIC class graduates in 1968. Uh, so it's a young school, let's say 50 years, a little under 50 years. Um, so our tradition is this entire period of confusion. We know nothing but confusion. Uh, we are responsible for confusion. Um, this is part of our legacy. Um, and I think, you know, when you have lemons, you have to make lemonade. So 
you know, maybe it is that if this is the, our legacy of the last 50 years, it may well be the longest period of Chicago, and we just have to realize it's a fact of life, not something that needs to be cured. Um, and, uh, um, you know, so between Netsch's field theory building and uh, my office under this twisted glass canopy, um, uh, what I want to start with then is this um, uh, alternative uh, that, in a sense, is set up in the conference between uh, tradition and innovation, or between tradition and technology. Uh, and it goes back, I mean, it's nothing current. Obviously, this is from uh, Rainer Banham's stock taking issue, a uh, series of es uh, essays that he wrote in the 1960s uh, in Architectural Review. This is uh, the first one in March 1960. Uh, where he basically outlines two columns, one is tradition and one is um, technology. Uh, and he sort of plays both against the other. And so for him, in 1960, this is already the problem. So in other words, to f structure this conference around those twin themes, tradition, technology, and what the relationship is, has a, has a bit of a history. The other uh, invocation, I guess, of, of Banham here, uh, when I realized that um, I, was, I was following Stuart, not only was I was deeply worried, but I also realized that we were meant to play two characters. Um, I don't know if Stuart will think, think of this or not, but I thought Stuart was meant to be Colin Rowe and I was meant to be Rainer Banham. Um, and I couldn't grow a beard or grow, smoke cigars, and Stuart might be a much better Colin Rowe than I could be a Rainer Banham. But I think that there is something about staging that debate. In other words, I want to, I think as we approach the contemporary, it's harder and harder to account for architecture either in terms of place or, frankly, even in terms of what's built. It's not a coincidence to me that Mies, who at least uh, uh, um, presumably said, build, don't talk, I think that as we move into the contemporary period, post-60s, into the 70s, uh, it's more likely to say that we approach architecture if we talk and don't build, or at least that that is, in fact, a more uh, likely way to get to architecture than the other way around. Um, and I think it's because, you know, part of it, so when I say technology and media, the issue of what has, in the contemporary period, made it difficult to identify place with the significance of work, yes, it's technological changes, but it's also ideological or polemical ones or discursive ones. And so that's why I want to link technology and ideology in the talk. Um, because I think when you say, how do you account for someone's work, you don't really say where they're from anymore. You say, where do they go to school and who do they work for? In other words, it's a very different set of ways of understanding a practice. It comes out of ideas and influence, not necessarily where someone is from. In other words, as a way of explaining, situating, and evaluating the work. Um, so this conjunction, let's say, between form and function, or I would rather say between form and ideology, because function is really functionalism, which is a particular ideology. Let's say that the myth, let's say, in any case, is that these are, rela these are transparent relationships through the modern period, uh, let's say, up until the post-war period. Uh, there's a linkage between form and function, or between form and what it's supposed to do. It looks like what it's supposed to do. It does what, it's, what it looks like. Um, the post-war period, and I think this is where the confusion might start, or that's the diagnosis of the contemporary period, starts with the post-war split, uh, really between uh, at least the surrogates that I thought Stuart and I were stand-ins for. On the one hand, uh, Colin Rowe, who basically argues that the distinction between physique flesh, or form, of architecture versus the morale word, or the ideology of architecture, uh, are incoherent and don't fit together. And Rowe's diagnosis, diagnosis is go with the form and leave the ideology of modernism behind. His alter ego, Rainer Banham, makes the exact same assessment. In other words, he says there are isms as styles, aesthetic things like cubism, and there are isms as slogans, like ethics, not aesthetics, as, as ideologies, like futurism. And Banham, for his side, says, let's stick to the message and ideology of the modern movement and leave the forms behind. In other words, for Banham, the forms are antique, uh, monumental vestiges uh, of even classical ideas of beauty that should also be rejected in favor of maybe a more hyper-machine aesthetic. So I think that, in a way, that split between 
physique, flesh, and morale word, or between form and ideology, between embodied, you could say, between uh, Colin Rowe, or, or also his partner, John Haydick, or collaborator, uh, or Bannum and his would-be collaborator, Cedric Price, you know, more or less get us two trajectories out of, you know, in some sense, mutually exclusive trajectories out of the modern synthesis. In other words, it's the beginning of the world falling apart. Um, not necessarily in a bad way, it just makes a certain kind of consensus no longer viable. Um, now, we could talk about one line as tradition and the other as uh, technology or innovation if you want, and in a certain way, Rowe's ambivalent legacy might be postmodernism, uh, and Bannum's ambivalent legacy might be high tech, and given that uh, our year of 1977 or 78, depending on how we date it, in terms of the uh, the art of the uh, the the uh, state of the art of architecture's recurrence today at the biennial, um, but around this moment we sort of see instances of both of these ideological positions manifest uh, in specific movements. Uh, not to say that there weren't also people who tried to hybridize them. People like Jim Sterling uh, in Stuttgart a few years after these two instances uh, at the Staatsgalerie, you could say. Uh, Sterling, of course, had personal connections both to Rowan Bannum, and I think that he's trying to, let's say, split the difference or uh, hybridize uh, the two parts. Uh, to bring the story home a little bit, I think that in some way, a few years after that, uh, the Thompson Center, previously State of Illinois Center by Helmut Jahn, is equally an attempt to hybridize the two traditions of the postmodern and the technological. Uh, so there is uh, this one way of, uh, of thinking that uh, recombination, let's say, that I want to hold on the table for a little bit later. Um, uh, sorry about the, uh, the text. Uh, this is, uh, I'm not sure that either, I expected Bob and Stuart to both mention this, but I think that, the, that when Bob talked about the challenge to Condit and other histories of, of um, Chicago as the birthplace of modernism that then unfolds uh, to Europe and back again through the Chicago schools. Uh, the dispute with the Condit story of Chicago teleology, um, one person who made it early, although I would say probably in a different way than Bob made it last night, uh, is Colin Rowe in the Chicago frame. Uh, and Rowe is, you know, the, the argument is essentially that uh, something like the Reliance Building is, is, as he says, it is what it is. It's a literal expression of economic speculation, technological uh, demands and capabilities. Uh, the frame structure in Chicago appears as a fact of life, uh, as a natural fact of life, driven by clients, economics, and technology. Uh, whereas he says the frame structure in Europe uh, is something it does not profess to be, he says. In other words, it's not Mies is this, it's Mies is something he pretends not to be. There is a, a kind of, Roe reads an ambivalence or ambiguity into Mies, uh, not the kind of transparency that we might associate with him, but in fact a kind of duplicity. In other words, maybe it's already Roe turning Mies into a kind of postmodernist uh, against the literal Chicago tradition. Uh, the idea is that in Europe, the frame structure makes its appearance, it's not possible, it's not necessary, it's not viable, it's purely an ideological construct. Uh, it's, he says, the frame in Europe in the 20s is an answer to the problem of architecture with a capital A, whereas the frame in Chicago was an answer to the small question of the office type, the high rise. Uh, and so it's, a, you know, I'm not sure that Rowe's even that interested in, certainly he's interested in separating those kind of large stories that equate the origin of modernism to Chicago, because he says that really modernism doesn't emerge until later, because for Rowe, uh, this corresponds a little bit to what I think Stuart was saying. For Rowe, that modernism is the simultaneity independent development of space and structure. So the problem with the Chicago experience is that either in the high-rise offices downtown, space is a dependent variable of the structure. You're constrained by the structure. Space is limited by the structure. Or in the case of Wright, uh, uh, essentially space, free space, is developed without the frame. In other words, if you want to do free space, you can't have a frame. Rowe's idea is that you can do both simultaneously, or let, at least, let's say, the Barcelona Pavilion is evidence of that, that you can have a structural logic that is the rhetoric of the frame and not have space be a dependent variable of the structure. Um, you know, and that's his idea of what modernism is, the independent relationship of both those ingredients, not separately resolved. Uh, 
So in a way, he's writing in the mid-50s, and I think it's you know, uh, basically around the time Crown Hall is completed that he actually writes the essay. And I don't really think it's a debate between 1890s and 1920s America and Europe, although it gets framed that way. I think it's really a debate. It's an essay meant to be a cautionary tale or an attack against the corporatization and institutionalization that Mises is facing in America at the time. Um, and so it's not really about this historical debate. It could be. But I think it's also a polemic about what's happening uh, to Mises' reception in America as it gets, basically as space starts to become defined by structure, when they no longer have an independent relationship anymore. Uh, simply this change in the shape of the column from a cruciform uh, or a round column uh, to an H or an I or an uh, extruded uh, rectangle attaches space to structure in a way that undermines, I think, for Rowe, the modernist idea of their separate independent existence. Um, so on the other side, and now we get to UIC, uh, Alvin Boyarsky, who was a professor and associate dean at UIC, um, and was Rowe's student at Cornell, uh, came to Chicago. Uh, they were long friends. Um, but I think he kind of had a, 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 became a kind of apostate, maybe, from the Rowe gospel. Uh, and in, in fact, you can see it in his essay, Chicago a la carte, which is from 1970. So this really begins, I would say, uh, the UIC story and the Confucian story, and also, you know, in a way, Boyarsky plays up, I would say, more of the um, Bantam side of the equation, let's say. And so his essay um, is, in fact, called Chicago a la carte, the city as energy system. Uh, and it's an incredibly dramatic wraparound cover on AD magazine that shows this uh, deep section of Chicago going from the rails and a deep tunnel system uh, the infrastructural changes that happen, the reverse of the river, the lifting of the city eight feet up, uh, the frame structure, the grid, uh, circulation, O'Hare. It's more or less a, a kind of uh, city of flows and um, connectivity, but also a, a thick artificial section all the way through the ground and into the air. Um, and so, yeah, this is going to be hard to read. Um, <laughs> Uh, I have even more text than Stuart, so I apologize in advance. Um, uh, this is uh, Alvin Boyarsky. It is a matter of paradox that while Marinetti in 1909 was publishing his ideological futurist manifesto, Daniel Burnham, with measured calm and the, and the backing of the Merchants Club, was offering the tantalizing image of a neoclassic collage, which would provide civic pride to the fort frontiersmen of Chicago. Um, Born, born in a flash, uh, I can't remember, due to the accidents of intercontinental transportation uh, with its uh, desired topological organization intact and developed as a self-regulating interchange valve of the greatest mechanical efficiency, from the very beginning, Chicago already possessed the basic hardware and Dionysian qualities of St. Ilya's version from Milan 2000. So basically, uh, Boyarsky's argument is that Chicago is a futurist city before the fact, and that it's a paradox that there's the obligation to wrap it in traditional urban clothing um, with, the, with the Chicago plan. In fact, Europeans look to Chicago precisely as this Dionysian energetic machine that he's sort of uh, brought out in this uh, urban section. Um, uh, and that this is really, you could say for Boyarsky, the true legacy uh, of Chicago. Uh, it's a kind of proto-futurism uh, that is maybe a little bit embarrassed and needs the cultural accoutrements uh, of Europe. Um, Boyarsky's writing on Chicago had an immediate impact on his student. Boyarsky wasn't at UIC long. It's the fate of being at UIC. Um, uh, and, but he became probably the most influential educator, uh, becoming the chairman at, at the AA, and, and his lecture, his first lecture there, his job interview lecture, as far as I know, uh, Rem Koolhaas, as a student at the AA, was in the audience. And it was really, I would say, Boyarsky's vision of Chicago uh, and his use of postcards as the archive of that evidence uh, that really is what makes Delirious New York possible. In other words, Boyarsky on Chicago is responsible for Delirious New York. Uh, Chicago is at the root of Rem's version of Delirious New York. 
uh, and, and equally a kind of reversion, uh, uh, an inversion of Rowe's Europe-America hierarchy. In other words, for both, both Boyarsky and even more explicitly for Kulhas, uh, there is something in the uh, explicit economic expediency and technological uh, abandon and Dionysianism and energy about America that is peculiar to it and that for Boyarsky, the Canadian, and Kulhas, uh, the Dutch, um, uh, this is, in a sense, uh, a kind of counter to Rowe's story. Um, an extension of, of that idea of a kind of fantastic city, and this is really from the work of Sarah Whiting uh, in her Superblockism essay. Um, you know, for Sarah, the, the, uh, the nature of Chicago urbanism is what she calls its elastic grid. Uh, the fact that it was platted territorially on the Jeffersonian grid, and in fact, can withstand the development of superblocks. In other words, if Manhattan is unable to withstand development larger than the scale of a block, Chicago actually flourishes in the elasticity of its grid and its ability to plan uh, and think of scales larger than block size. And so her entire archaeology, some of these south side projects, you know, including uh, um, Michael Reese and IIT and uh, uh, Marina City, um, in Federal Center uh, are basically examples of how Chicago, in a certain sense, can insert in its fabric larger than block size urban visions that are antithetical to it, that are different visions of a city inside the city. Uh, and again, it's a sort of ideological experiment that could happen because of the looseness or flexibility of Chicago's grid as opposed to, let's say, Manhattan's grid. Um, I guess what I want to suggest in this, and, and that's why uh, maybe I've got more words than work, uh, is that what Chicago's known for is bluster, bravado, hot air, both in a technical and a, uh, a rhetorical sense, uh, and that in fact that this is its legacy. In other words, its ability to uh, make ridiculous claims for itself, uh, its boosterism, uh, it, the city is invented through speech acts. If you say something, it will happen. Uh, so be careful what you say. Um, there is a kind of get down to it business that is in fact celebrates the possibility of really production of different ideologies. And so maybe a little bit differently than Bob, I don't think that we import our ideas. I think we generate them and then don't take responsibility or credit for them. Uh, so I, I think that in fact, Chicago is a hothouse for the development of ideology. One of them, uh, I think certainly, I wish I was here in the 70s uh, to have witnessed the Chicago 7 and Stuart and Tom and Stanley and uh, everyone else. Um, as a way, uh, and I know Kim mentioned, mentioned this also, uh, to, to challenge the dominant legacy and teleological unfolding of a particular uh, Chicago story in face of a, a kind of version of the heterogeneous story that Bob also told last night. Um, and so, you know, the birth of postmodernism, maybe it isn't exactly in Chicago, but I think it's uh, a strong contender uh, for being the birthplace of postmodernism pre Charles Jenks, uh, and certainly as an ideological force. And in a force, you know, again, uh, back to the UIC connection, on the one hand, we have Boyarsky and the invention of a kind of Kulhasian futurist um, infrastructuralism, uh, but UIC is also the legacy of uh, members of the Chicago 7, Stuart, who was there maybe for, uh, for the longest, um, but also under the directorships of Tom Beebe and Stanley Tigerman. Uh, and so the idea of a recent, relatively new school going through so many uh, ideological transformations and sending out uh, the sorts of polemics, and you could say, you know, again, and I'll talk about this image a little bit later, but it's not uh, anti-Mies and it's not even anti-Crown Hall. Uh, it is no doubt, like Roe, anti the institutionalization and corporatization of those tendencies. Uh, and I would say, um, uh, you know, in a, in a way, it's the argument of boutique offices against large professional corporate offices. I mean, it's a generational kind of warfare uh, in which Mises was a kind of fellow traveler, I would argue. In other words, not the enemy at all, but actually one of that group. Um, the group can now, since he's in the room, can contradict me uh, afterwards. Um, but I think that the same sort of spirit is in uh, 
uh, I think they were trying to swerve the tradition by recuperating Mies against the followers. Um, you know, later on, Paul, you know, Paul Florin and Steve Wyspowski would more or less introduce deconstructivism a few years later. Um, oh, I see I'm almost running out of time. Um, so the legacy, uh, in a way, of Goldberg, of, of Stanley, is a legacy that we also try to tap into at the school. Now Sam Jacob and Paul Anderson of Indie Architecture. These are two projects by two of our current faculty. Um, but also the birth of what has come to be called digital, digital organicism. Greg Lynn, uh, who was teaching uh, with Stanley, with Stuart, with myself, with Doug Garofalo, uh, his stranded Sears project of 1991, really taking Sears Tower, making it pliant, uh, animate uh, along the river, breaking it down. Uh, this is all pre-digital work. In other words, it has an architectural project without a technology yet attached to it, although it will become a digital project. It will quickly become a digital project uh, when you get to Columbia and the paperless studios. Chicago, at UIC, we didn't have the means or money to have such technology. So Greg basically cut potatoes. Uh, uh, and maybe you can see some of that in the collaboration that Greg and Doug Garofalo did uh, in the Korean Presbyterian Church in New York uh, a few years after that, or Doug and Ben von Berkel, UN studio for the pavilion, which I think goes back to Netsch's field. Uh, I'm just gonna uh, go quickly. This is an argument I make uh, fairly uh, sort of to our incoming students. I mean, to kind of take a look at where practice is, let's say, in 1992 versus where a school is in 1992. And so this is just an example of a project by SOM by Adrian Smith and a project by Greg Lynn at the same time uh, in the studios at UIC. Again, part of the cut a potato uh, as an informal way to develop form. Um, but the point is, of course, that there's very little relationship between another version of, you could say, of historicist contextualism meets high tech from the professional office versus what will become a kind of organic, a digital organic project of informalism at, at the academy. And then, you know, jump 20 years into the future. Uh, now this is uh, Smith Gill. Uh, and, you know, the point is that it has nothing to do with the work they were doing 20 years earlier. It has to do with the work that the schools were doing 20 years earlier. And so, on, on the one hand, I think the job of schools is to be out of time with the work that's going on, but also has to think that the way, the trickle up, the way in which work that is uh, developed and techniques that are developed as they unfold and transform the office culture is something we have to be attentive to that untimely relationship between those two things. Uh, this was a slide I didn't finish. It was gonna be a lot of recent work and I was gonna ask you two questions like who did it and what do they say about it. Uh, I'll give you those punchlines since I didn't get to put it on the slide. Uh, another version of that multiple choice test for you is uh, this is from the recent issue of Chicago Architect. Uh, three essays by Michael Sorkin, Aaron Betsky, and Gordon Gill. Um, so you have to match the conclusion with the author. Um, can, uh, a, figure out how to make our world more beautiful, open, and sustainable. Conclusion two, commit to projects that are environmentally sound, economically viable, and intrinsically beautiful. Conclusion three, invent forms of urbanization, urban organization that will lead to sustainable, equitable, and beautiful futures. Um, if you're keeping track, it's CAB, um, but uh, I'll give you extra credit if, like me, you say, who cares? <laughs> um, uh, and in a way, that's the point, and it's about the point of the work I was showing, too, because I think that the issue, and this is a napkin sketch I did last night, so apologize for that. Um, the difference between 77, one period of confusion, and 2015, let's say our period of confusion, um, is that in 77, people were doing different forms, and they talked about them with words that were different, and more or less there was a loose alliance between the form and the word. In other words, you know, maybe the words were bigger than the forms, or the forms encompassed the words, maybe they were tangent to one another, maybe they overlapped, Maybe somebody had, like Peter Eisenman, serial words that would explain the entire oeuvre separately at each, any time. Um, but there was some loose account between different ideologies and different forms. Uh, and I think that today we're in a case where there's a convergence of form and there's a convergence of words and they have no connection at all. In other words, there's a formal convergence 
And there's an ideological convergence evidenced by the three quotes from Architect, but I, I, I meant to do it from the offices from those images, but just next conference. But in a way, we have R&D and product development as our form generator, and we have marketing and advertising as our, as in place of ideology. And so to me, this is the loss uh, from 77 to now. Um, you know, it, I don't mean it to be a uniform condition, but I do think that this is part of the world that we live in. Um, so back to the conclusion of tradition versus innovation, um, uh, or historicism versus uh, technology, I actually don't think they're disjoint at all. Uh, I think they're, in fact, quite comfortable with one another. Uh, there are simply two ways that architects deal with either history on the one hand or science on the other. In other words, his tradition is one way to deal with history, historicism. Innovation, technology is one way to deal with science. Um, I would say that in, in these cases, they're not the only ways to deal with history and science. They're one way. Um, and in both cases, it sets up a sort of idea of an origin or a paternity. That's what history does, historicism does, um, that allows one to produce models and copies. The other basically produces ends. So in other words, the first gives us clear origins. The second gives us clear ends. We innovate. We know what the problem is. We just have to make a better mousetrap. We've already established the parameters of the problem. We're not looking beyond that. We're innovating within a set constraint. My version is we should need to do two different versions. We need to do another version of history is an untimely one, or what I would call genealogy. Another version of science is not innovation, but really experimentation, which is how do you produce hyperfactuals, counterinductively. In other words, this is the other way science proceeds. And so I think that there, there's a different way that we need to do history and science. It's not a debate history versus science. It's just how are we going to do them and to what ends. Um, and are we trying to stabilize our identity and give ourselves a kind of essence? Or are we interested in a transformative model which is based on artifice and the fact that we can become something else? I thought it was really interesting last night when Bob said that Mises' contribution wasn't to building construction of materials that had already been taken care of by Kahn, uh, but what Mises did was overturn decorum. I thought that was an, a beautiful expression, uh, and I actually think that's what architects do. I think that's one role for architecture. Architecture for sure can stabilize identity and give us a sense of place and past and future and origin and end. Uh, but it can also make new worlds that don't exist. And so I think that there are two jobs for architecture. We can choose to do different ones. Let's just be clear about which one we're doing uh, and why we're doing it. And so again, the sinking of the Titanic uh, is in reference maybe to the slavish copiers. And so on the side of maybe what Stuart was calling misreading, although what I would call genealogy, something uh, I will reappropriate, uh, Crick and Sexton. <laughs> So we can have a fight over uh, Mark. Um, uh, but I think the, the, you know, the curtain wall, the, the folded curtain wall, liter the literalization of the curtain wall as a curtain, maybe Lily Reich me meets Mies in a certain sense, is one of those improper crossings over. Certainly, I know one that um, will set off gasp in this room, but um, uh, OMA Student Center at IIT, same thing. In other words, Yes, Mies, with Superstudio, with the shopping mall, with the city of Pompeii, impressed by the infrastructure of this huge tunnel. I mean, it's a little bit like Alvin Boyarsky's image upside down. Now the tunnel is pressing in on top of the project. The infrastructure is revenging itself as its uh, mechanical system. Uh, maybe even up to Will Aritz's recent additions to Crown Hall, the two little cute, ironic office cu uh, cubicles. Uh, I don't know if you've been down there. I'm sure John has. Um, uh, sort of weird little roofless Miesian patio houses inside Crown Hall, the miniaturization of Mies inside of Mies, double. Um, it's a curious version uh, of misreading. The last few slides are just simply work out there. This is by Thomas Kelly, one of our faculty members. It's a super graphic facade of historic windows on the windows of the Cultural Center. This is one of the installations at, uh, um, uh, I think there's actually a Driehaus Museum uh, window somewhere on the right. Uh, there's a, uh, a, a unfortunately no longer Prentice uh, set of windows up on the upper right. Uh, but basically a kind of archive of different windows, super graphic in the, in the plan. This is another project by faculty from us, from UIC. This is um, Stuart and Allison from Design with Company. 
And what they did, very much like uh, our friends in the mid-70s, the Chicago 7, in this case, they restaged the uh, Harold Washington Library competition of 1985, uh, rather than the Tribune competition of 1922, uh, updating, uh, and I would say, um, there might be more to this work's relationship to our uh, legacy of the seven than you think. This is UIC's contribution by Paul Prizer and Paul Anderson uh, to the pavilions. It's called Summer Vault, so it's a thin steel vault. Uh, with very sort of supple, subtle geometric shifts, exterior and interior, that make it hard to read the figure in, in its entirety, as simple as it is. I would also say it's the only one that was on time and on budget, but... Um, and we're not the practical school. Um, the other trajectory, you could say, we're coming out of UIC, Sarah Dunn and Urban Lab, David Brown, uh, his uh, available city, um, Ports, um, Big Shift, and, in, and the kind of small environments project by uh, Sean Lally, which is really about how you use energy uh, as a way of space making as opposed to mass. The other ones are larger, let's say, Chicago sort of infrastructural transformation schemes in the case of Sarah and uh, uh, Port, uh, Andy Modrel. Uh, David, David Brown's is really how you fill in the 15,000 empty lots the city owns and how you make an urbanism out of a very distributed situation. So it's almost like a super block that's been blown up and spread out everywhere. It's a, it's a size of the downtown loop, uh, but it's just distributed over the fabric and how you, but how you think of it as a cohesive urban territory. Um, and there were uh, collaborators with that. Um, uh, I see Blair back there. So uh, I know that the one on the upper right is not one of his favorites. Um, but I, I, one, one of the debates I want to engage in, because I know that that's consistent with things that, in fact, Blair has said earlier about uh, Stanley's work um, in an earlier show that was also Big Bold Visionary or something very similar. Uh, Stanley Tigerman would get rid of, or to use his euphemism, deaccession some low density neighborhoods while pushing for higher density living along Lake Michigan and the Chicago River and making way for urban farming. The architect presumably does not live in a neighborhood that would be deaccessioned. Um, we can all laugh, ha ha um, But the, my point is that these kinds of projects are not about reality. <laughs> in other words, it's a mistake to judge them under the terms of this is going to happen and eviction notices are going out tomorrow. In other words, that's not the tradition of architecture. It's not the tradition of, of drawing. Uh, these are words and drawings which are meant to provoke alternative worlds whose half-life is not the immediate situation. And we have to be able to separate ourselves, architecture, from its immediate situation. This is a, a different deaccessioning de that Ungers, Ohm Ungers uh, uh, used in, in Berlin or the Kuhlhaas in Rotterdam. Um, and I think that, in other words, for me, is a project by Neil Denari. Here's a, here's a project by Doug Garofalo, which is in a sense is the same thing. I'm sure you could say, well, urban farming on the L tracks. I mean, how are we going to get to work? Um, you know, it's not the point. The point is not that we're going to immediately get rid of tracks and put farms on them and you won't be able to take the brown line anymore. Uh, the point is this is what architects do. For me, architecture, I think there are, there are too many people that think that architecture is a medium of nonfiction. I think architecture is a fiction medium, not a non-fiction medium. I don't think it has to be judged by the facts. That's not its job. Uh, the fact is that Doug's work gets translated, in fact, to someone like Neil Denari in New York. These ideas and projects migrate. They're not meant to be assessed in terms of the reality of them impacting the ground and who's going to be evicted and who's going to have to move. Uh, and so I would like to end with uh, uh, a last slide by Doug uh, because I think he uh, characterizes this to me. Doug is my co-pilot. Um, Doug was a graduate of both Notre Dame and Yale, and so uh, I suggest that he be posthumously named the next Driehaus Prize winner, uh, if anyone has any influence out there. Um, he was also at UIC for 25 years. So Doug is the perfect uh, triangulation of Notre Dame, Yale, and UIC. So thank you.